All right. Well, it is uh, half past the hour here. And so I welcome everyone to the third viewfind session of the day here at WolfCon. Uh, and for this session, we have two speakers. We have, well, we have two presentations, multiple speakers, but uh, the first will be virtual. The second will be in person here, and then we'll have a Q&A after both of those. So I will uh, turn it over to the Equinox team to uh, tell us about layers of accessibility in open source software. Great, thanks so much, Damian. Um, we're excited to talk to you about um, accessibility in open source in general, as well as some work that we've done specifically uh, for Viewfind uh, slide. We are Stephanie Leary, um, is, who is our front end developer who has done the bulk of this work um, and really excited to uh, show show this to you guys. And Stephanie, in addition to being a front end developer is also a use, uh, usability and accessibility expert. And she's been doing a lot of work both with Viewfind as well as with Evergreen and a lot of the other software that we support at Equinox. I am Andrea Bunt Simon. I'm the project manager for software development, um, which means that I, you know, get to the un the enviable job of being able to talk about all the cool things that, that my developers do. So, um, yep, go ahead, next slide. And at Equinox, we are uh, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so we support um, library open source software in all kinds of organizations, not just libraries, but also cultural institutions. And um, we're always happy to work with you on anything that we don't support now. But Next slide, here is a list of what we currently work with, um, as you'll see if you find on that list, but we also have worked with Ask and Discovery, um, Koha, Evergreen, Subjects Plus, Fulfillment, ILL, and Coral ERM. And in fact, we were founded by a couple of the original developers um, of Evergreen ILS who are still on our team. So that was where we started, but we've expanded uh, significantly in the past couple of years, the things that we support. And as I said, we've been doing a lot of accessibility work um, for a few of these products because it has been um, a place where a lot of improvement is needed and we're happy to be able to, to bring those. Uh, improvements. Um, and that is my real quick introduction, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Thanks, Andrea. Sorry about the back and forth with the slides there. Um, so our agenda, briefly for today, we're going to talk a very, very quick overview of the accessibility um, landscape in general, what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to talk about some updates to um, the standards and legal requirements that we all have to worry about talk about some specific challenges um, in open source projects in general, um, and some of the ones that apply to Viewfind with frameworks like Bootstrap, and we'll talk about um, our work with Viewfind. So very briefly, um, I think many of you probably are not totally new to accessibility, but in case you are, what we're talking about here is how to make our web interfaces work for people who use assistive technologies primarily. Um, there are some accessibility topics that we talk about that don't have to do with assistive technologies, um, but those are the kind of the big ones that we worry about. We want to avoid design patterns that cause distress or confusion um, for people who have some sort of disability. We want to ensure that everyone can accomplish their tasks regardless of their personal, um, physical, or mental health challenges. Um, this is a great diagram that Microsoft um, has produced in their Inclusive 101 um, package uh, that they have online. It's great. We tend to think of disabilities as like um, permanent lifelong conditions, but they can be situational. They can be temporary. I think um, everybody, uh, even if you don't have some sort of physical disability, you've definitely had the experience of trying to look at your phone screen in bright sunshine or watch a video in a loud room without captions, and that doesn't work very well. So distractions, um, environmental concerns, you know, temporary conditions, all of those things kind of feed into the things that we talk about in accessibility. There are sort of four major types of disabilities and then a couple of things that are like cognitive things that can be triggered by visual, um, visual issues. So these are the, the major categories that we talk about. And the cognitive stuff is a little bit new to the accessibility world. That's coming in um, WCAG 3, which is like the next major version down the road. A little bit of it is covered um, in WCAG 2, which is the current version that um, is out now. So what are like some of the functional issues that we worry about a lot? 
form fields needing IDs um, and labels and having their error messages linked up properly. Buttons being um, actually like using the button tag rather than having an on-click action added to something else so that they work with keyboards. Uh, looking at headings and structure, thinking about the HTML um, structure very deeply, um, thinking about not just how it looks, but how it's going to sound and the different roles that um, different HTML tags have and how those are announced in screen readers. Thinking about as you move through the page using a keyboard rather than a mouse, what's the tab order like? Can you see where you are at all times? Does everything have a focus outline so that you can tell where you are? Um, when we have repetitive link names like read more or add to list, are those distinguished in some way for screen readers who might be hearing them out of context? Or does it just say read more 20 times? Um, and of course, alt text for images is the one that I think most people um, are familiar with and kind of start with when they start with accessibility. And then the cognitive accessibility issues have to do with attention, things like visual noise, high contrast, um, which is the opposite of what people with visual disabilities need, right? For, for visual disabilities, we wanna create a high contrast version. For people who have attention disorders or some sensory processing issues, we might wanna not give them as high a contrast. So having user options can be really important here. Um, thinking about the use of color, if your brand guidelines include red, orange, or yellow, those can be problematic for people who have um, some sensory processing and like anxiety issues. Um, so we got to think about how to minimize the use of those emergency alert colors. Um, mobile support is a handy shortcut for thinking about the page layout. It's not just mobile, it's thinking about people who use uh, screen magnifiers and a high zoom uh, for their text. So if it works well and reflows well for a mobile layout, it probably will work reasonably well for those assistive technologies as well. And then thinking about how to support memory issues, we want to make sure that the layouts for similar functions are consistent throughout the, the site or the application, um, that we don't move things around and, and treat uh, you know, an advanced search form completely differently on one screen than we do on another. Um, and then make sure that our forms are supporting autocomplete uh, so that people don't have to remember things like passwords and, and, and type things over again that their browsers may have saved. All of these things are spelled out in accessibility laws, but those have been sort of vague um, and um, nebulous uh, in the past. The good news is that no matter where you live in the world, your accessibility laws, if you have them, are based on the web content accessibility guidelines. There is one set of guidelines. There may be a translation. There may be a, you know, a difference in version that's specified in the laws where you live, but this is it. Um, and I've put some quick links there to those guidelines. The U.S. legal situation is changing slightly. Um, up until now, we've had a state patchwork of laws, and we've had a federal Section 508 um, that covers all software, not just web software. And if you work in higher education, you are probably familiar with this because your purchasing people have said, hey, you have to comply with Section 508. Um, there is a new proposed rule that clarifies the web accessibility requirements. And this is just in the last week or two, the DOJ has published this um, request for public comment that, um, at the first link here. And what they are proposing is a clarification to the ADA's Title II um, that really spells out what everybody's responsibilities are in terms of web um, accessibility requirements and what the timeline will be for compliance. Um, not everyone in the accessibility community is very happy with this proposed rule. There are some criticisms of the all or nothing approach and the estimates of the cost and effort um, that are included uh, as to what it will take to get in compliance with WCAG too, if people are not already. Um, so uh, if you haven't taken a look at this and your um, institution is in the US and you, you know, your physical um, facilities uh, have to be compliant with the ADA, I would highly recommend that you look at this document um, and take a look and see what you think um, and leave your comments. Uh, if this rule gets proposed, we will have a two to three year timeline from the, the institution of the rule, uh, depending on the size of your institution. Canada also has had a patchwork of uh, provincial laws that are um, being sort of rounded up similar to the US uh, into one federal uh, standard, uh, the Accessible Canada Act. Um, so Can 
Canadian law is not my area of specialty, but uh, all of these, again, are just based on WCAG. And so is the European Accessibility Act and all of the other web accessibility laws around the world um, that are linked here. So some challenges that we have as open source projects in like complying with these legal requirements and keeping up with these standards. As you all know, none of our open source projects operate in a vacuum. We all depend on this stack of other open source projects and technologies. Um, and really there are many pieces that go into any open source project. And the accessibility problems may not come from the part that we are building. They may come from things that we've inherited from other frameworks or the language. Um, and so the part we make is not the only thing the user sees. They see this entire stack at once. And we sort of become beholden to our users for the accessibility problems in this whole stack. Um, and so in Viewfind, we have you know the theme that we are using, which is probably a child of the parent um, the, uh, default Viewfind theme. If you're using the default theme, then that includes Bootstrap and is built on the Laminus framework and all of that rests on PHP. So when we were developing our theme last year, you know, we found that, you know, we had introduced some accessibility problems in the part that we were making, but there were a number of things where we could point back and say, actually, this came from Bootstrap or this came from the Viewfind parent theme. And so what we've been doing is kind of going back and picking out those problems and bringing them back to the appropriate spot in the stack and trying to get them um, addressed at the source. So the challenges though, are that many, many, many developers are just not aware of these accessibility issues and how to deal with them. Um, and then uh, for those framework developers, what is the motivation? And, and up until now, what has been the consequence for not dealing with it? Um, designers and developers typically are not taught a lot about accessibility in degree programs and boot camps and things like that. It's kind of considered a specialty area which is really frustrating because it's something that we all need. Um, bad advice on, on creating accessible interfaces is everywhere. Uh, don't even get me started on the AI assisted, like how to make your thing accept because it's taking all of the bad advice from the web and just regurgitating it in concentrated form. It's terrible. Um, so training materials that are correct are actually kind of hard to find. And a lot of the training materials on general programming topics omit the accessibility considerations because it makes things too complicated. Or, you know, the, the author or the instructor doesn't want to deal with that or doesn't think that it affects enough people that they should deal with that. And so this is a major problem um, in developer education. And then in the open source projects, how do we kind of get everybody on board? Open source volunteers are not usually employees. And so we can't just mandate that everybody go to accessibility training. Um, and then how do standards get set for the project? I have been kind of baffled looking at, um, you know, Evergreen, uh, the ILS is built on Angular, which uses Bootstrap um, also. And those communities have a very interesting approach to accessibility that I don't really agree with. Um, and so um, I actually love the approach um, that Damien and Chris and, and the Viewfind team have been taking, um, and y'all have been really proactive about dealing with um, some of the issues that we've been filing. Um, and we're not the only ones, of course. Um, the accessibility problems are, are being addressed really well in Viewfind. Um, other projects, not so much. And so if those projects are something that, that we are using, we need to kind of think about how do we go back and bring those problems back to the framework developers. A lot of framework developers will say, well, if someone has a problem with it, they can file a bug. I have a really big problem with that attitude because I don't think that end users know where in the stack those accessibility issues are coming in. And so they don't know where the most appropriate place to file that bug is. And I don't think that the bug systems are always accessible. Um, GitHub wrote a great piece recently linked here uh, on treating accessibility issues as bugs and not treating them as feature requests. One of the things that's really frustrated me in Angular, <clears throat> excuse me, in Angular is seeing accessibility issues be closed for lack of interest. Um, that's not the appropriate way to handle accessibility bugs. 
So the open source frameworks, particularly, um, I'm picking on Bootstrap a little bit here, um, have not really been held accountable for the accessibility problems that they have introduced into the stuff that we are building. The accessibility laws that we've been talking about really don't apply to the projects so much as they do to the organizations using that software. So the university that implements um, Evergreen or Viewfind will be held accountable for accessibility, but the project itself, does it have a legal obligation? Um, and so interface bugs may be filed in the wrong place. They may be filed with that end product and not ever get filtered back up to the framework where they originated. And really, as open source developers and, and users, we need to be a lot louder in holding the framework developers accountable for their work on accessibility. So let me talk about Bootstrap again briefly. There are some major issues in the older versions of Bootstrap. Color contrast um, is a big one I'm going to talk about in a second. A lot of their um, interactive toggles uh, that are um, used for things like dropdowns um, originally were not keyboard accessible. That's getting better. Um, they're not great about form fields uh, having labels in some of their examples, and their ARIA hierarchy is frequently just a mess. Uh, so the Web AIM group, the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, has a report that they put out every year on the top million home pages, and they they just do an automated scan and see how many accessibility issues come up. And Bootstrap comes out worse <laughs> than pages that don't use Bootstrap. Uh, so there's frequently more accessibility issues in a Bootstrap page than there are in uh, some other framework or, or a page that's not using a framework. Uh, Stripe.com did a great overview of the color issues in Bootstrap 3 and 4, and none of the default colors that come out of the box in those versions meet the basic accessibility requirements for color contrast. And when you darken them to the point that they do, which is the list over here on the right, you start to lose the distinctions, especially in the yellow, orange, red range. Um, and this becomes really obvious when you look at buttons. So the the set on the bottom is the one that actually meets the, the contrast requirement, and that's a lot darker, it's less cheerful, it gives a very different overall feel to the application than the brighter colors at the top that unfortunately don't meet their contrast requirements. So as we were going through our viewfind theme, I made a big spreadsheet um, of the differences between Bootstrap 3, 4, and 5. Uh, and so if you are the right person to tackle upgrading, uh, that would be great. Uh, this is a reference for you. There are a lot of issues that have been fixed in version 5.3 of Bootstrap, um, and I'm really pleased with the direction that they're going, but those older versions have a lot of issues. Um, so as we were building our viewfind theme, one of the things I focused on was our keyboard um, interaction. So you can see here we've got uh, one of the navigation items at the top has a big bright uh, green border around it. These um, dropdowns originally didn't support keyboard uh, controls. You could only get there by the mouse. And they didn't have focus outlines because this version of Bootstrap included a rule that turned off focus outlines specifically for keyboard users. It's very frustrating. Um, so we fixed that, you know, thought about, okay, how's the focus outline going to look as we move down the page and we open these different menus? Um, and so this is just... Um, a very visible example of the accessibility work that we did. A lot of the other things are totally invisible. We wanted to make things, you know, look the same, but work better for screen reader users and other assistive device users under the hood. And so thinking about the HTML headings, using landmarks correctly, making sure that the form uh, fields have labels. If, if something looks like a list, let's make it marked up as a list. Um, we fixed some things with table structure and headings. We thought about the adjacent links, especially in things like search results where you have a book cover uh, next to the title of the work. Um, those links go to the same place and they're read twice. You know, why, why, why do we need that? Uh, links that are ambiguous, I mentioned earlier, those sort of repetitive links like the read more style of link that just gets repeated down the page for multiple items. Um, we wanna make sure that those are disambiguated somehow, that we say, you know, not just add to list, but add this specific work to your list. Um, and then thinking about places where we have badge counts, is that included in the list? Is it separate? Are those you know, two adjacent links that go to the same place? How does that work? 
Um, so the next thing that I'm going to be focusing on in the viewfind theme is this area above the search results. This is very busy and there's a lot that you would need to listen to before you ever get to the first result. And as a visual user, it's very easy to skim down and say, okay, the first result is down there at the bottom. I'm just going to kind of overlook all the, the rest of this stuff unless I need it. As an audio user, how do you skim this? Um, so we need to be sure that we've got headings and landmarks used here in a way that makes this as easy to skim as it is for a sighted person. We have been doing a lot on accessibility um, in the last year. And um, this is where I apologize to Damien for dropping a bunch of PRs and, and issues in the GitHub repo <laughs> and then running away to work on our other contracts. And I'm hoping to be a lot more active uh, now that we're working through some of the um, outstanding contracts that we had when I joined Equinox about a year ago. Um, we have a lot going on. Yeah. And um, a lot of those outstanding contracts uh, can be directly blamed on me. So <laughs> it's not for, <laughs> not for lack of wanting. But um, I come but... bearing documentation. Uh, yes. By way of apology. <laughs> yes. So and this is um, not only the bootstrap upgrade uh, spreadsheet that Stephanie mentioned a couple slides ago, but she also um, wrote specific to, um, it, it was written for Evergreen, but is not just about Evergreen. Um, it is a lot, there's a lot of good general content in the, the Developer's Guide to Accessibility, which is linked there. This was uh, funded by our partners at King County Library System um, in Washington State. But there is a, a really good comprehensive overview of, of accessibility in Bootstrap um, and ARIA. So if you're working with projects that use Bootstrap, I would definitely recommend checking that out. The idea is it's easier to teach developers to not write accessibility problems than to go back later and fix accessibility problems. So that was sort of the genesis of this, was to start um, educating, like I said, particularly evergreen developers um, about ways to be better front-end developers um, in terms of accessibility functions. Because a lot of the work that we've been doing, a lot of this contract work has been fixing that, um, those problems. We've, some of those dozens of pull requests that Stephanie has submitted and run away, I think I counted it was like 85 or something pull requests between Viewfind, um, Angular, like NG Bootstrap itself and Evergreen specifically related to accessibility issues. And about, I think, um, 60 or 65 of those have been accepted. And that's just in like the last nine months of work that we've been doing. Um, we talked about some more of this in depth um, at our ALA poster presentation this past June. And that link takes you to a little uh, subjects plus page, ironically with Subjects Plus has some accessibility issues that we're also looking at, but a lot of the content from our presentation as well as related content, um, including our poster, a narrated version of our poster and some um, background information, other links are available there. Um, we're gonna be doing some training workshops um, and have given, uh, have talked about um, accessibility in past presentations, both uh, at conferences as well as on our own Equinox EDU platform. And then a list of, um, just a, select, a list of the accessibility bug fixes that we've done the first half of this year just for Evergreen um, is available there that I, I actually put that together for another customer, but I tossed it in here because it shows you like, we've really been doing this at you know, a pretty good clip uh, the past nine months. And we're gonna committed to continuing to bring uh, accessibility improvements to all these different open source projects that we participate with. Um, obviously we've contributed um, bug fixes to Viewfind and the uh, default theme that we're still working on. And then uh, I blew by this a little bit, but NG Bootstrap, um, Angular itself, like we, Stephanie has proposed and had accepted a few patches directly to Bootstrap, which is higher up that ladder, like she said earlier in those slides. So that is going to be improvements that will trickle down to everyone using those frameworks and bring accessibility improvements to all the projects that are using those framework frameworks. And like, we're gonna keep talking about this, keep doing this. We're really happy to be able to talk to a slightly different audience here at Wolf, uh, WolfCon about what we've been doing. And um, there's gonna be a lot more to come. So um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out directly to either one of us. Um, you can sign up for our mailing list if you're interested in hearing more about what we're doing at Equinox, so. That's it, I wanna go back briefly and just say that this developer's guide to accessibility, as Andrea said, is not really specific to Evergreen, although it lives on the Evergreen Wiki. There's only about two or three pages that are specific to the Evergreen ILS um, right. and the, the Angular Bootstrap framework. Everything else there is really general accessibility. Um, and some bootstrap specific stuff that is, is also applicable to viewfind. 
And that is as comprehensive as I could make it while still being really concise. <laughs> and so I tried to cover everything and especially focused on Aria and trying to demystify that a little bit, because I know that's a really confusing topic for a lot of people, even if they sort of know um, a lot about accessibility basics, Aria can be really challenging. Um, so we have a whole section devoted to that. And keeping an eye on the chat, I want to give Kate a shout out for having been such a loud advocate for accessibility in higher ed um, and the Code for Lib community for all these years. Doing great work. Um, if there are any questions, we will do them, I think, at the end after the next speaker. Is that correct, baby? That's the plan. So, all right. Thank you both. This is great. I look forward to talking more. And a uh, round of applause while I uh, set up the slides. For Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>